beginning Love me, love me, love me, say you do Ding, 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 ding Let me fly away with you Ding, 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 for my love is like the wind And wild is the wind Oh, wild is the wind You touch me Ding, ding, I hear the sound of mandolins You kiss me dang 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 with your kiss my life begins oh your spring to me all frogs to me don't you know your frog it's Welcome to the C.M. Kozunin Frog Extravaganza. Hello, everyone. The endless quote, uh, the endless quest to classify and review almost every known genus of frogs goes on at the U at the CM Kosaman amazing frog cinematic universe all frogs classification bing bang bong extravaganza and this is episode 6 and maybe we will finish it at this episode maybe am i gonna finish later we don't know i don't know but we are continuing our review of every frog group on the world in the world with this latest incursion into the Ranoidea group that contains proper frogs. So I don't want to spend any more time on int introductions and formalities, but just before beginning, remember to support me on patreon.com CM Kozaman. This has been a mammoth undertaking and it will be really nice to be compensated, not directly for this presentation, but you know, just for being who I am. And if you're already supporting me on Patreon, thank you so much. Maybe you could like also give a hand from the other side by maybe referring me to your friends and thus getting more people on board the wacky and Sisypian enterprise that is the CM Kozaman podcast YouTube channel. And also special thanks to Ater Prometheum for their support in the intro segment. If you like that bit, you can also support them from buymeacoffee.com slash Prometheum S. That's the link here. Okay, let's go. We had reviewed this enormous expanse of species, clades and groups. And last we checked, I think I was at... Oh, we were at the beginning of the Ranoidea group. So we had finished the Hyloidea and we had finished the weird ball sack frogs of Lake Titicaca with frog, not frog-like, but seal-like faces. I kid you not, watch the previous vi videos to see these guys. And we had reached this junction. We are, oh, we had or also reviewed this big group of strange mole-like Indian frogs and their strange relatives in the Seychelles Islands. So we had now reached the Ranoidea, the final and almost the biggest group of frogs. This group contains the proper frogs. I don't know. I don't even know what a proper frog means anymore because as you see over and over, things that look like pond frogs or toads or tree frogs or little micro brown unidentifiable frogs crop up time and again in different lineages. But if you look at their evolutionary relationships, they actually come from a widely different selection of places so it's all academic at this point but here we go so before beginning 
within Ranoidea, there's this enormous subgroup called Microhylidae, the micro frogs, and they're just micro and vibing. Enter full screen. Okay, so this is Adelastes of the Adelastida, Adelastinae group. This is an archaic and like very basal group. You know, they're very smooth, almost like chocolatey. But I'm not gonna make a reference to the bullshit, gimcrack, disgusting series that is Harry Potter. And you know, they had chocolate frogs there. And man, I hated Harry Potter even before J.K. Rowling showed herself to be what she is. And anyways, I don't want to spend too much time dissing on things because I'd rather talk about frogs. But the entirety of the Harry Potter franchise was about cons conformity. And it was about the destruction of the outcast. And there's just something just so gimmicky. And like it's one of those hidden evils that society will realize was totally evil like 500 years in the future or something. So, yeah, if you if you like Harry Potter, I just agree to disagree. Moving on, <laughs> you got the amazingly big, enormous group within the micro Hylidae called the Asterophirniae, which is like... You could kind of translate this as star frogs, and like the stars, their numbers are like endless. Oh, you got all these guys, all these guys. Uh, we're gonna go through them all. Barigenis copula, Austrocheparina, Coerophrin. But anyways, before beginning, we have this ba this guy within this group. So where does it fit? Asterophris. So I'm reviewing them by alphabetical names now. I'm not reviewing them by order of divergence because like, it's just too complicated. But once again, if you like this kind of st stuff, if this pushes your buttons, consider becoming a zoologist or a frog researcher. I really mean it, by the way. You know, I, I make many jokes, but this is one thing that I say seriously. Like the diversity of life is like a really great area to study. And if you enjoy it, you could have a career in it. Anyways. We have in this group the Asterophrys frogs that kind of look like Satan. Or they look like the original idol that the Knights Templars worshipped be before people thought they were worshipping the the demon goat guy kind of thing. But it really looks like a, a crown, like a kind of king, but it's tiny and it's reptilian. And its eyes know neither remorse nor com compassion. It's just a beautiful, beautiful kind of dark creature of course we ascribe these adjectives later it's just it's just a cool knobby skin for camouflage these guys literally pretend to be shit i believe in order to camouflage themselves in the forest floor what a way to live then you got afantofrin which is another very diverse group of tiny small tree frog like customers with only three digits on their hands so that's strange and they also have like this kind of like almost weird toad-like thing, but their face kind of looks like a pond frog. It's all, it's all confusing these days. Do you like girls or boys? Ding -a ding -a ding -a. It's confusing these days. If you know which song this is from, you're you're a cool guy or cool gal. Then you got the big radiation of Australian small frog guys, represented here by Ostrochaperina robusta. This is the robust Australian chaperine frog. I don't know, but its eyes have this nice reddish color and it's just beautiful. This whole group, this whole micro holiday group consists of little understood, strange, tiny frog things like these guys. Then you got the, the Barigenis genus, which is kind of like small, pig-like, but completely unrelated to these earlier frogs we had seen in the previous video you know these belong to a completely different groups of frogs but if you didn't know better and you just found these guys living in papua new guinea you might think they're related but they're not and they're just beautiful they've got this like puffed up pear like plum like shape and they're really tiny i mean just look at this this wide honking chonkin guy it's it's so lovable, so beautiful. And the name is also very descriptive, Barigenis. Like, as you know from Barion, uh, Baro means heavy. So, heavy frogs. Heavy chud, heavy chudbud frogs coming up to mess up your day. 
and then you got the related genus and another extremely diverse genus, Calulops, which consists of these like little uh, plum or raisin-like guys. I'm not even gonna attempt to describe them, but some of them have these like amazing star-like things on their bodies, which I think is really cool. Calulops. If you study frogs for a career, you might get to describe a new species of these like very easily, like almost every week. There's a new species of tiny frog described somewhere in the tropics, mostly. And then you got this genus, which is just amazing. Coerophrin, uh, represented here by Coerophrin proboscidea. Now, these are very tiny, once again, Papua New Guinean or maybe Indonesian frogs. I don't remember clearly. They got these like tiny, spiny noses that go bibble, bibble. And then... What's really cool about this, like an entire spectrum of species in this genus is named after like this na 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 na, this like Aryan European, like uh, Indo European names from the, oh, I forgot, but it's from like the Nibelungen, the German, German saga epic of uh, basically European greatness. It's like one of the founding texts of European culture. So some guy named Ray J.J. Menzies named an entire spectrum of these frogs from the Nibelungen. You got names like, oh, I mean, like, uh, I hope these like YouTube right-wing uh, neo-pagan, like my European culture fascists never get a hold of these names. You got names like Coerofrin Brunhildae, Coerofrin Fafniri, named after Fafnir, Gudrun, another name from the Nibelungen, Coerofrin Gunari Ganar, after Siegfried, Swanhild, and the best, Coerofrin Valkyrarium, which is named after a Valkyrie, motherfucker. And if you look at that, it's like... <laughs> These tiny frogs with little noses, they're like... I wonder if this guy was kind of like secretly dumping on this uh, European greatness, aspirations of greatness by naming the most ridiculous creatures after them. Or maybe he just had a team going, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to like pass any judgments about this researcher, but it's just like very counterintuitive. It's almost like a work of surreal humor to have animals like this living in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, and some guy comes and names them after the Nibelungen. <laughs> I mean, just, and also like, of course, this is the ultimate Chad body form. This is the ultimate OG top G frog. Just look at it while I, I'm sipping Linden today because I feel kind of down, kind of under the weather. How are you feeling, everybody? Hope you had a nice day, nice night, sat down in front of the TV or popped open your smartphone or tablet or whatever. And I hope you're having a great time watching this series. And then in this big family, you also got these frogs, Copizalus, which these might actually come from South America. Once again, I wish I had taken detailed notes, but they're great. They're just tiny and they go ip, 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 in holes of wood, wood holes, and they just hang about. And then you got Gastrofrinoides borneensis, which is a form from Borneo. Similar to that purple Indian burrowing frog, it's kind of purple and kind of smooth nosed. And un but it's completely unrelated. But it's just a beautiful form. I also love that its hands have this kind of mallet finger syndrome, apparently. The last digit bends sharply downwards. And it's just a great, great aesthetic to see on an otherwise smooth and completely liquid looking animal. I like these little aesthetic tricks that nature does. I think it's just something that that's just sublime. And then in this uh, group, you also have Hyloforbus. Uh, at this point, I'm sometimes skipping over entire genera, but once again, these guys are like brown and small and hang about, and they have like hundreds of species no one knows about. And then you got Mantofrin, which is another like brightly colored, like small tree frog-like kind of thing. I don't know. This would be a joy to paint in watercolors with all these like subtle oranges, yellows, and dark shades. And then you got the genus Oinia, represented here by Oinia sanglaubi. 
I mean, what can I say? I just like saying the name Oinia, like some sort of Greek or Roman tragedy. You know, they would say Caligula, and you would say Oinia. Anyways, moving on. Then you got Oreofrin oviprotector. These frogs uh, actually protect their eggs, and if you look closely, the little frogs are doing the little can can dance inside the eggs, completely skipping the tadpole stage and developing into little frogs themselves. So this entire genus takes very well good care of their eggs. And as you can see, it's got like, I don't know, six or nine eggs as opposed to hundreds, like some other bad parent frogs out there. But it takes really good care of them. Oreofrin. And because the name has Oreo in them, let's give this mom some Oreos. Take it, frog, and take good care of your baby. Anyways, moving on, this, group, this genus Oreofrin has many, 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 many species. As we are used to seeing, you got pink boys, red boys, spotty brown and black boys, big boys, big boys, and a bit, a bit. give them all Oreos. Anyways, moving on. You got pedophrin, another very tiny species. Once again, it's one of the smallest frogs out there. Like, we've seen a number of those, and they all come from different families and groups. But this guy is posing in on top of a little penny or a quarter as as many of these frogs are sometimes posed i wonder like they're on this like imagine someone pl places you on this tiny this enormous metal disc with arcane inscriptions and faces and you feel like you're on stargate but no it turns out it's just a quarter Bling! moving on then you got the strangely proportioned genus siamophrin which dwells in caves this is a cave dwelling toad not a toad, a frog thing, from Vietnam, and it's Siamophrin troglodytes, and it's you can see it's specialized for cave life, including a lack of pigmentation and really big hands, strong big hands with gnarly fingers and big toes as well. You know what they say about big hands and toes, but uh, actually this is a cave dwelling species, and its tadpoles are also very strange. It, they got these like funnel shaped mouths. Maybe they use them to increase their odds of catching prey or detritus. I don't know, but it's just really strange. This entire vertebrate lineage has become adapted for cave life. Moving on, you also have this genus, Spenophrin, which also takes really good care of its babies. And it also has this kind of spiny leaf making fold action going on. You know, we've seen so many different groups of frogs do this and it never fails to amaze. And I really like this, how these little frogs are piggybacking a ride on on mommy. And mommy looks like a, a satanic leaf. It's just beautiful. My head hurts from like phrasing all the lines I'm about to say sometimes. So I need to blow a steam by singing. Anyways, then you, in this group you also have Xynorhina, another poorly known s s genus and represented of this, of this genus have like, like these kind of pointy noses, but they're also dumpy and brown and weird and wonderful. And you also got this genus called Chaperina, which is again small and it dwells on leaves and less on leaf litter. And it's just wonderful with these like bright colors. One strange thing this guy has is that in this genus, sometimes you see these tiny single spikes on the elbows. So my man is a fucking Krav Maga master. You know, if you know anything about Krav Maga, the brutal Israeli mixed martial art, you know, they have a lot of like elbow hits and back of the palm hits and something. And it's just about doing the most damage in the shortest time possible. And this guy is not to be fucked around with because it knows Krav Maga. It can give you like... Like one back of the elbow and like you got three fractured ribs or something. I don't know. And then in this in this group you got the smallest and the best named frogs of them all. Mini Mom. Beep 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 and look at it. Look at it. I mean what's there not to love? They have sacrificed everything to become this small. They've sacrificed their digits, their hand is just one finger and that knob of flesh. They probably don't have inner ears properly developed. They'd probably have, like, what is this guy even doing? Maybe its lungs are even atrophied. It probably can breathe through its skin. And it's just hand hanging about. 
and <laughs> it's just beautiful. This guy was named relatively recently, I think in the 2010s, and ugh, I just need to zoom in. This guy's this grime here in this guy's fingernails just makes me want to vomit. Anyways, moving on. This was Minimum, beautiful frog, beautiful name, beautiful species, and then oh, I think we oh no, we are still in the micro highly dia group. You also have slightly larger frogs in this group, such as Anodonta hyla, represented here by Anodonta hyla rugsae, and like those chaparina frogs with their elbow spikes, these guys also have these kind of like nipple cartilage projections, like on the sides of their chests. I think maybe it's to like hug their mates nearer, but I don't know why this feature exists, but anyway, it's cool. This guy also gets bonus points for having these enormous spatula-shaped toes and this rad, rad, rad gold and black skin pattern. Moving on, you also have this genus Plethodontohyla gwenteri, and there are many, many, many species of Plethodontohyla, and they all have these like nice, sometimes bright, sometimes drab patterns, but they all help them camouflage in the forest floor. You also have this guy, my man, my man once started a porn bander in 1993, and never went out of his home again. And he just was watching porn and not showering for decades and decades. And he turned into this. A cautionary tale, boys and girls. Rombofrin Kudraoui. And anyways, that was a tasteless joke. But these frogs represent, I don't know, like bird excrement or lichen or something. They also all live in these wet, wet places. And this is the kind of like... <laughs> habitat I would like to exist. Imagine if all cities were like that. Everywhere is wet and humid and warm and everybody's just, you know, slapping themselves on the pavement, looking like pavement stones and something. That would be a city to live in. I don't know. And then in this group you also have another like tiny, extremely small frog species somehow related to mini mom, but somehow also not. This is I think this is a Madagascan species. Yes, I, I comfortably know this to be a Madagascan species. Stumpfia, the stumpfy frog, Stumpfia pygmia. The new, the tadpoles are already tiny. They are no bigger than punctuation marks. If you can look at this, like surface tension limits the sizes of bubbles at a certain size, and these guys are like sometimes smaller than bubbles. So they're they're like if you spit on the pavement and count the bubbles in them, these frogs could live in there as tadpoles. Then when they metamorphosize, they're ridiculous. They're smaller than a match head. And it's just amazing how this guy crams all like an internal skeleton, lungs, digestive system, brain, eyes, everything into this tiny space. It's just wonderful. And then when it matures, it's like s scarcely smaller than a fingernail. And it, it very unusually has this like, I, I really like this, like single toe action going on here. So that's Stumpfia. It's a very widespread genus in Madagascar. There's dozens, if not hundreds of species. And these are some of them. I mean, in one in one research paper, scientists discovered up to 26 new species of Stumpfia. And not all of them are microscopic like these guys. Some of them are like, like, I don't know, the size of a coin or the size of a button or, I don't know, the size of a nipple or something like that. You know, they're not all tiny, but there's an enormous diversity of them. So in one paper, as you can see, 26 new species of Stumpfia from Madagascar. How cool. And these are some of them. And then in this group, oh no, moving on to the Discofinia subfamily, you also have the famous tomato frogs, also of Madagascar, Discophus antongili. These are like very remarkable, distinct frogs, but somehow they're related to these like strange, small drab frogs. But, but there, there are many species of them. Then, you got the Gastrofirnina subgroup represented here by Chiasmocleis albopunctata. And I mean, it's like a small Lamborghini. It's smooth and its legs are small, like kind of like a low riding motherfucker. Beautiful guy. And then, of course, these frogs are famous for having these partnerships with tarantulas. And, you know, this is Chiasmocleis ventrimaculata co inhabiting a burrow with this comparatively gigantic tarantula spider and they just hang around and even the kids play with them. Apparently, 
this is a symbiotic relationship like people think maybe the frogs eat the tiny ants that you know they can kill these spiders when the spiders are resting basically and then the spider in turn protects the frogs from other predators basically uh, maybe maybe it's like a true intentional cooperation or maybe these animals are just they have their best interests in heart but it still results in a cooperative act but and you know if it's an illusion who cares as long as it works and both parties are kept alive and here's another picture this is ridiculous because they're like imagine like a man is jogging with their chihuahua and then i don't know like a, a, there's like a gunshot or something so they both start running and <laughs> they're just running so i believe these guys live in south america for for the for the record then in this group you also have the got the ktenophrine frogs now these frogs are remarkable for their strange freezing posture when something scares them they just freeze in praise place and like extend their legs about so they like do they look ridiculous but somehow it camouflages them or i don't know and <laughs> the a related species dazzy pops also assumes this stance when they're mating what these guys do they also have some sort of skin glue which the male uses to glue himself to the back of the female so you really can't like pry these apart unless you hurt them and of course they didn't want to hurt them so now that's how they mate imagine like you're on tinder and some or something you get a match with someone I'm like my place totally what's the address sending you the link right now and then you come into their address and you know you walk past the rusty cars in the front yard and something like oh there you are Le, let's put on the glue and then i don't want to describe what happens later but these guys do it all the time i think they got the best sex life in the vertebrate kingdom anyways then you got the other small like this is a more medium-sized genus but even though this is comparatively larger than these guys these guys these guys these guys these guys you can see some aspects of their anatomy are still reflected so they got the same strange look they got the same extended nape area there are probably glands under this thing and they got the same weird rubbery derpy look dermatonotus muelleri and then another related species elachistocles surinamensis from i think Suriname, which i think is yeah it's part of africa today today so these guys are all over the place they live in southeast asia africa south america very widely distributed and poorly understood group and probably it will turn out to be somewhat artificial i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if they split this enormous group micro into several subgroups in the future and then you got eras uh, elaki stockles sounds like a greek philosopher eraki eraki erythrogaster means red throat but just it's just beautiful it's like a jade sculpture of a frog moving on you got gastrophrine another a extremely diverse group carolinensis so i believe this is actually found in north america a, a tiny north american species and then you got the very diverse genus hypopacus and its name apparently means somewhat thick referring to its tough skin uh, it must be a very like subtle way to insult these frogs how dare you call them thick just look at this face you know just because they fail at maths can't call them stupid look at this face they're beautiful all right it's it's you who is thick okay moving on can't move on my computer's stuck on these beautiful beautiful frogs which one is your spirit animal mention in the comments uh, with a time code so i know which frog so far has been your spirit animal and we can work our way from there on moving on you got the other another species another genus like this this clade is so diverse myrciella microbes with it's like i mean this guy has seen things and it notes things and it's like and this guy is like pure golden goodwill and you can all read it from his face i'm not gonna comment anymore my rciella microbes and then you got the tiny wide-bodied almost like as wide as, as it's long cookie-like frogs stereocyclops 
incrassatus. So it's not crass. It's tender and loving. And then you got the little known South American frogs. Hoplofrin. I don't know if this is South American to be honest. Okay. I'm out on the location, but this is an interesting frog because they apparently build nests inside hollow bamboo stems. And to make things more complicated, the males also have these like gnarly sadomasochistic sex toy action going on with their thumbs and the flesh around their thumbs. And also like the inside of the elbow or the upper arm also has these fleshy spikes. So they kind of like grab, you know, and... I'm not going to comment on this shape, but I am going to comment on their habits. And this like another, another slanderous nature article. It says, Holofrin ulguriensis lays its eggs between leaves of the wild banana or within the stems of bamboos, which have been split sufficiently to permit the entrance of a small and greatly depressed frog. This is like the subtlest form of slander. How dare you call him this, this depressed? He's working through some issues, okay? He has to have work three jobs at the same time, supporting a home, all these eggs, paying the rent for that bamboo stick. It's okay for him to have some episodes. Small and greatly depressed frogs. I guess we're all small and greatly depressed frogs in our Lord our year of the lord 2023 no i don't know where the world is going to to be honest but that's a conversation for an entirely different podcast i hope you're all feeling well by the way i mean uh, tasteless jokes aside i hope my podcasts bring you a sense of charm joy humor laughter it's it's important these days <laughs> and then you got these guys in the uh, Calofrininae subgroup, Calofrinus intelineotus. Now, if you've ever been to Greece or you're one of my Greek watchers yourself, you know that like when old ladies are petting uh, a cat or admiring a baby, they say, Kalo, Kalo, ah, Kalo, mu, they say, and Kalo means like good, basically. And it's like, oh, nice one, good one, come here. And this, this, this frog, this entire genus really deserves that affectation. Kalo, kalo, just look at it. It's like a little warty egg and coin purse, but it's just thoughtful. And oh, you have room, you have room. Keep it the same. Anyways, moving on. Kalo, kalo, Frinus baluensis. It kind of differs from the other Calofrinus species by having like long Popeye the sailor arms and shorter legs and kind of like a sturdier texture and a pointy dainty nose. Kalo, Kalo, and Kalo, oh my god, what are these Kalos doing? They're making more Kalos and, <laughs> and they're looking very deadly serious while they're going about it. Well, I mean, <laughs> ah, these are so beautiful. I just love, I just love researching animals in detail. Doesn't have to be frogs, could be anything. Kalo, what are you doing? Kako, Kako, what are you doing? What are you doing? So this Calofrinus species is accidentally mating with another species of completely unrelated frog. It's uh, mating with a frog from the Ocidozyga genus, which is from a com completely different group. But hey, man, love is love and you do you as long as you have the safe words memorized. Okay. <laughs> and there are a lot of papers like this. Like if you Google. So one second. Oh, okay. So one, one of the greatest things about nature articles are these short notes, you know. So there are a lot of like great and grandiose articles they're like classifying or reclassifying or re re reclassifying animals but actually i think the meat and bones of uh, zoology or any kind of scientific studies comes from these very short nature observation articles sometimes they call them short notes or herpetology notes or whatever notes and in these notes they're like 
in one issue there's like a hundred of these short notes and they're all like wild wild observation like somebody's mating with a completely different species something is eating it has never no right of eating like all sorts of weird and wacky adventures so if you like some good reading some good science some real science there i say go read these herpetology notes or any kind of short notes field notes or something they're really really insightful kallo 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 kakko okay moving on and then in this uh, group, you also have the Melanobatrachinae subfamily, represented here by Melanobatrachus indicus, the starry galaxy frog, they call it. They live around India, I believe. And then it's just wonderful. It looks like a, a galaxy. And you know, it's got the swag, it's got the drip, and it's just beautiful. Anyways, in this group, you also have the Microhylinae proper group now. Represented here by Glyphoglossus mollusus. And yes, it is really a frog that deserves the name molasses. Just look at it. It's like a dumpy, burrowing, pudgy little frog. Once again, remember this weird shape evolved time and time again in this group and in other groups. So it's just really cool. I think God is trying to tell us something. This is the perfect being. Moving on. In this group, you also have the Kalola frogs which are kind of like cute, arid environment frogs. And then you got the Metafrinella group, Metafrinella genus. Now, these guys apparently have a propensity to nest in like holes in trees. So if these guys see a moist, dripping, like wet, puckering hole in a tree, they just can't resist it. They just dive in there, lay their eggs and reproduce. And this is um, another species, Metafrinella sudana. No, it's actually the same species, but it's just, it's owning that hole. It's demolishing that hole, absolutely. Becoming one with it, perfectly camouflaged. And here you, you can actually see some of and these holes. I don't know. I hope the algorithm doesn't think this is something that it is not anyways. And then, of course, they also do this thing in pipes because, you know, it's a human artifact. It's perfect for this job. Anyways, moving on. Then in this gene, in this group, you also have the, another enormously diverse genus, Micrileta, represented here by Micrileta Aishani. Once again, beautiful, subtle, subtle shades. This bluish gray, well, verging on electric blue, just beautiful. And then you got the extremely diverse genus, Nanohyla tiny frogs basically i'm not even gonna like attempt to describe them any further and then you got this genus kind of like a toad like customer but it's actually classified with the proper frogs euperodon euperodon it's kind of like a <laughs> beautiful I, I just look at this thing isn't it great to be alive in the same time and on the same planet with this guy i think it's just wonderful and this Euperodon have a lot of species. And if you scroll through all these images I've put together, they look like they're having the most whack house party of the century. Euperodon! He Perodon, she Perodon, you Perodon! Someone screenshot this and turn it into a t-shirt, please. And wear it and send a picture to me you me you parodon you notice some of them have these orange accents some have these yellow accents some have this ghost skin which you can buy with the extended dlc for only 99.99 anyways moving on then you got in this group the frinella genus which is kind of like these like moist toad like but tree frog like things and then you got these guys otofrin which are kind of like more larger and more robust, pointy-nosed, leaf litter mimicking frogs. And then these guys actually, like, they're already very interesting in this form, okay? But when they're tadpoles, they have something else going on, which I have never seen anywhere else in the animal kingdom. It's unbelievable. So if you look at their teeth, they look like, Whoa! they're like some wicked shark-like teeth. But no, actually, because these tadpoles are so small, the teeth somehow work as a sieve. Now they've got one other thing going. Can you can you see it? Can you see it in these pictures? 
from the side of their bodies for no reason there's an enormous tube coming out like the exhaust of a jet engine what happens is these guys apparently live on shallow streams so they turn upside down and burrow in the sand and the sediment under the stream for some reason this pipe comes out of this body and the water goes in from the mouth and comes out from the pipe and it says if this lifestyle interpretation is correct then it makes it the first known fossorial vertebrate to known to have passive filter feeding so these guys litter these guys literally live and work like little barnacles or or anemones or coral or sponges and it's it's very strange i mean i, I don't know how this works let's read this stomach contents include a variety of bacteria and microorganisms but no fragments of microscopic animals so these like scary oh shark teeth they're actually for capturing small detritus basically and then that, 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 that i had difficulty understanding this so it says since the robusta larva does not burrow deeply the tip of its spiracular tube probably extends upward above the sandy bottom and into the current so this somehow extends above the sand and then this creates a pressure difference because the water moves this way and it basically sucks the water in through the animal and thus sucking it's like a rotifer my man unbelievable and one interesting thing is these guys have this completely unexpected adaptation so this is one of the crazy things about nature you know if someone designed a speculative evolution filter feeding tadpole they would probably make it with like a big funnel shaped mouth but nobody would imagine this thing this evacuation pipe but you know nature is like really wicked and crazy and i don't know how this feature evolved but it's really really like it was this was one of the most mind-blowing facts i uncovered while researching this amazing series of ep episodes then you got the related synapturanus genus which has many like smooth-nosed chocolatey looking frog frogs and they're very diverse and very beautiful one of them ha even has the name uh, species name synapturanus zombie and of course the the mediocre scientific ifl crowd had a field day a zombie frog discovered and so cute oh my god and but look at this what's in your head in your head zombie 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 b b ah 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 and then uh, with their tanks and their guns in your head in your head they are chunking what's in your head anyways moving on zombie zombie i can't stop singing okay moving on then in this group you got this very wise and sly customer Phrynomantis bifasciatus uh, once again a colorful genus maybe it's even somehow poisonous i don't know but just look at its shape it's got a heavy jaw for a species like this really nice and beautiful uh how many slides are we in by the way oh no it still isn't over <laughs> this is gonna be the death of me really still isn't done anyways moving on this species because of its uh, bright colors is also somehow seen in association with these giant african driver ants so it like somehow the ants don't attack him maybe it somehow like eats them and like reflects their poison somewhere i don't know but all the some of one of the scientific papers about this co-inhabitants uh, has pictures of this frog being examined by ants so like somehow it ac ac adopts this submissive posture and ants are like <laughs> examine it and they give it like friendly a kind of friendly rating so they don't tear it apart and eat it but for the frogs this must be like an alien abduction thing i mean these like strange big-eyed alien robotic creatures come out in the darkness of the night and they just examine you 
and stroke you with their antenna. I mean, look at, and, and you know, he's seeing things, but no one believes him. Anyways, zooming out, moving on. Then you got this uh, genus in the Scapfiofrininae, subgroup of the Microhylidae mega group, Paradoxa palmata. And these guys have also really weird tadpoles with like, these extremely set apart eyes. They almost look like little hammerhead sharks or catfish, I don't know. And then in this group you also have Scafiofrin gottibei, which has this beautiful puke green, tomato red, and linoleum purple gray pattern with these black splotches. It's just a beautiful frog. And other species like there are lots of varieties of these guys and they're just beautiful even though it looks like a toad note that it has these like big uh, suction pads on its toes so a nice mixture of features as well and this is what the tadpoles look like the tadpoles apparently feed by burrowing head first into into sediment and filtering it so that's why i have these like oh these are not the same genes but maybe these guys do it too i don't know Sorry, I'm confusing things, but yeah, these Scafiofrininae tadpoles always do this. They burrow head first and they just wriggle, 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 wriggle. Imagine you're swimming in a lake and then this guy comes and tries to burrow into your belly button. Reactions in the comment section only. And then, oh my god, we're really finished with the Microhylidae mega group. Uh, for nearly a hundred slides, we only saw this group, huh? How many, how many, how many? Unbelievable. What was your favorite micro hylid frog? Let me know in the comment section. Okay, then you got the more like quote unquote proper frogs. Like these are, like if you live in Europe and you see a pond frog or something, this is gonna be from this family. Afrobatrachia. No, 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 wait. Or maybe, yeah, I don't know. But now these are more like proper pond frogs. You got the Afrobatrachia mega group within the Ranoidea mega mega group. And then you got the Arthroleptidae subfamily represented here by Arthroleptis. And it's just a normalish looking frog. After all these little weirdos, these guys look like kind of boring to be honest, but they're also beautiful in their own right. You got Cardioglossa, another small gracile species. And it's also represented in lots of stamps, including this one from the Republic of Cameroon. Cardioglossa elegans, beautiful stamp, beautiful frog. And then you got Acyloternus, which has these cat-eyed eyes, pupils, which is really beautiful. Almost like a regular frog trying to become a tree frog. And then you even have the fascinating red-eyed version. Astylosternus diadematus, the diadem-eyed, red-eyed one. And then in this group you have the famous wolverine frog. <laughs> X-Men, Abid, 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 all these weird features, you notice they also call this the hairy frog sometimes. Because it almost purely lives in water, almost never goes out, and this fringes, they're actually not hair, but extensions of skin, basically. And they help it breathe through its skin, so it extracts oxygen from the water. What this guy also does is like, if it's under stress, it literally like, does this kind of, David Cronenberg like fro finger breaking action. It breaks its own finger bones and the claw bone pokes out, but it actually dislocates the tip bone of like, it's like dislocating your knee to turn it into a spear almost, but that's how it defends itself. Must be very traumatic. But also frogs like many amphibians can regenerate lost digits and limbs. So maybe it doesn't hurt so much. I don't know. In this group, you also have the extremely diverse species genus Leptodactylodon. <laughs> All these like little jelly bean customers just moving about. And then this is what their tadpoles look like. I dare say the tadpoles are more interesting than the, the adults because they look like these like fluke or strange uh, leech kind of things or jawless fish from the dawn of time. And they have these like strange mouth parts and I think this helps them like scrape the river bottom or something again. And then in this group you also have like the strange nocturnal cat-like looking Nictibatus frogs 
represented here by Nictibotus corrugatus, once again a wide-mouthed, just beautifully patterned frog, almost like a tree frog once again, but appearances are deceiving. So this is their tadpole. Once again, the tadpole is arguably more interesting. It's like a latex uh, pipe from a 1950s vacuum cleaner come to life, something. Another related, related genus is Scotobleps gabonicus from Gabon with enormous, enormous eyes. And then you got like proper tree frog-like looking frogs. But remember, these are classified under the Ranoidea group. Whereas the group containing proper tree frogs was Hyloidea, and it was like also a two episode lo long monster to study, Leptopelis kivuensis. And there are many species of Leptopelis, as you can see here. And they're all beautiful. They got the red eye action going, the brown skin, green skin, I don't know. And then one of the these guys, of course, has been documented in the most ridiculous position. My man, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's trying to shag a slug. Oh my god. And the slug has his breathing hole open. And like, maybe he should stick a finger in there. Hmm, suck it. Who's your daddy? Oh my god. Oh my. What's he do? Um, unbelievable. There are actually entire studies and even data sets uh, examining what these frogs are shagging, basically. Because when they are in go mode, Frogs really go crazy. They they mate with anything and everything, including different species of frogs. Okay, this is okay. Maybe love is love. What can I do? And I I'm certain that this leads to hybridization in closely related forms. They sometimes have sex with dead frogs as well. Though I don't know how they ascertain this. I mean, maybe they were having sex and the frogs, the female somehow died. And then they have been recorded having sex with objects or non-amphibian species. It's like New York or San Francisco on a busy weekend night. Mm. And there are apparently patterns of these. Like, So some frogs are very proper. So if you look at these this stats, the micro frogs, which we saw earlier, they're very proper. They're like, okay, marriages between sanctified by God and between a man and a woman, they don't have any uh, sexual e experiences outside their own. Yeah, they're good guys. Good Vanilla Guys Club. Uh, whereas some of them, like this guy, the As Ascafidae, there are extensive records of them having necrophilia, but this could be a sampling error. Whereas these three groups, okay, they're like the real offenders out there. Like all necrophiliacs and like this Buffonidae group, the toads, they have they apparently shag everything unbelievable and and this is like a really nice article if you're into data science you could also like download this thing they have their data sets published and maybe turn it into a, some sort of cool data visualization project a global database of misdirected and places in anurans so so there go for it and then in this group you have the brevi brevisipitidae Brevi family which contains some of the best frogs the rain frogs in uh, africa and south africa they all have these sad faces and they're trudging along and this is bale breviceps hilmani a more basal form and this is also the same species but just look at the environment first i thought this was like some sort of fantasy game created in uh, in blender or unreal engine but not actually it's this frog in its natural habitat why are you so sad, man? You live in the best place. And then moving on, you got Breviceps, which is a desert frog. This is a photograph by Tyrone Ping, by the way. He's a great South African herpetology photographer. So go look him up. Tyrone Ping, P-I-N-G. Breviceps, Macrops. And these are <laughs> just the best. I'm unbelievable. Breviceps, Fuscus. Just so angry, can't keep it in anymore. <laughs> Anyways, and the way they mate is something else. They have these, like, once again, glue like body secretions. So the male goes, like, I just glue me myself to your butt and shag you forever, I guess. Duh. And then just they walk around like this. When the female walks, the male actually waddles from side to side and they 
they just waddle away, waddle, waddle, waddle. And then in this group, you also have the like slightly longer legged forest floor living species, Kalulina. It still isn't happy. I mean, there's this, there's obviously a great hole in these frogs' lives that they just simply can't even fill with hot glue on sex. And they just walk about sad and unsatisfied, like dusty salesmen on a Wednesday afternoon. I don't know. And then you got the Probreviceps, which is kind of like probably an ancestral form, but it's kind of halfway there between like quote unquote more normal frogs and these like flat faced beauties we all know and love. And in this group, you also have the cave dwelling Speleophrine genus with a heavy jaw. And, <laughs> and like just one x ray can show you like how deceptive the skeletons are because these guys all look like fat, eggy egg boys, huh? But if you look at their skeletons, it's actually very simplified. They don't even have proper ribs. The collarbones are like some sort of second weird uh, hip bone almost near the chest. The skull is very simplified and the, the limbs poke out of the body at knee and elbow level. So that's just, just beautiful. And he waddled away, waddle, 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 okay. Then in this group you also have this Hemisotidae subfamily, which is, they call them pig frogs, I think, or they call them shovel nose frogs, all right, lovely. And they're just spotted and just beautiful. And just this like, and once again you see the kind of unbelievable pig-like body form emerge once more. Hemisus guttatus, and then there's also Hemisus marmoratus, which is really tiny. Like a jewel, a precious jewel you hold in your hand and you give, present them to your significant other and says, will you marry me? And of course they should, I mean, after a gift like this, heck, you know it's gonna be a, a marriage full of love. Anyways, then you got the Hyperolidae, big group, they're also known as bush frogs or sedge frogs. They're an extremely diverse African group once again. And there's a subgroup in them called Acanthixalinae. Acanthixalinae, represented here by Hyperulus spinosus, spiny bush frog. But then most of these guys are actually extremely brightly colored and small and loud voiced frogs that, that are very common in Africa. So they got many, many different colors like Afrizalus quadruvitatus, a pale specimen, a pale genus, once again to confuse us, Cryptothylax, Heterizalus, these Madagascan painted frogs, they're just beautiful. And they just got the like most beautiful zoot suit patterns. Unbelievable, look at this. Heterizalus rutenbergi and Hyper Hyperolius. Like some sort of Roman name. I mean, you can really see some of those like bullshit right-wing youtubers like <coughs> sargon of akkad saying like I, I was just reading up on my hyperolius and to him it says stripes are virtue anyways moving on but these guys are really like brightly colored beautiful all shades of red green stripes spots and this guy has a little midge in his ear and it's all green wonder if of course, it's a chance association, but it would be cool if, like, there was a race of intelligent amphibians and they wore little insects on their heads like jewelry. And then there is this guy, Mororella, Cyanophthalma, the cyanide, beautiful orange frog. And there's these guys, Ophistotylax immaculatus, having immaculate, smooth latex body action. And there's this guy, Tachycnemis, it means, I think, Fast Joe or something, or Knema, I might be mistaken that, but Taki certainly means fast. Fast something frog from the Seychelles Islands. And then you got the Cassininae subgroup, represented here by Hyalambates maculatus. And this group is specific for not jumping as often, apparently they just run around like tailless lizards most of the time. And they also have these like nice... Uh, brown on black and yellow pattern and th this, there's something really nice about their like low profile and this like flattened head just beautiful 
and there's also this genus in this group, Semnodactylus. It's a seminal, seminal, beautiful form. You guys run along. And then maybe in this group there's this like difficult to place species called Chrysobatracus, but you know, we'll just leave it there. Not much is known about them. And then we move on to the Cerotobatrachidae subgroup. And this is like the famous horned African bullfrogs that eat everything and everything. But before you get to them, there are also these outlying forms such as Alcalus from the Alcalinae subgroup. But then you get to the proper Ceratobatrachinae group, which has these guys. Cornofer, like the name of a demon. And like a best demon, it has got this spiky trident action going on with, with its face. And these like raffled edges, just, just beautiful. And then you got... Also, you have cornifer species that are not as spiky, but they're still in the same genus. So, smooth cornifer right there with direct development taking place in its eggs. Little cornifers getting ready to corn all over the world. And then in this group, you have the platymantis species, which are more tree frog like, represented here by Platymantus navrioti. And then you got the small. Liu Raninae group. You, there's no escape from these small groups. Like whenever frogs get together and they're like, oh, I don't know, there's this project going on. We gotta have these tree frogs. Okay, that some motherfucker is gonna have no. Also have 280 small brown things just associated with them, just to just to vex naturalists, I guess. Liu Raninae represented here by Liu Rana species, but it's very strange because in this oh. And that's it. That's it for the Ceratobrachidae group. Okay, so I'm very sorry. The African bullfrogs were not in this group, but they were somewhere else. I think this is where they are. The Conrauidae, big group, family, represented here by Conraua goliath, the goliath African frog. And these are like the largest frogs in the world. People harvest them for meat in their local environments. And I think it's, I mean... I'm, I'm sad to see this frog die, but I'm also kind of glad to see it being eaten as a protein source because if these guys were farmed, their diversity would be ensured. Their tadpoles are also enormous. Just look at it. Just hold it. Hold the tadpole. Never let go. Never let go. Moving on. You also have smaller species in this genus, such as Conraua crassipes, which are not as big, but they're still beautiful. And I love this kind of keyhole-like pupil shape. And then, where have you moved? So, we are still in the Natatanura group, but then we have moved on to the Dicroglossidae family, the fork-tongued frog. Once again, these are a little known, small, medium, tier looking, but actually very interesting and very diverse group. If you look at one thing, their feet are enormously long. And for some reason, the head is big. It's just beautiful. Ingerana. Tenas sedimensis. And then in this group, you also have Oxidoziga frogs. You remember these guys from way back when one of the Calofrin frogs were trying to uh, forcibly mate with one. And then in this group, you also have Nanorana, which is not Nano at all, but it looks like a flat. There's something about its looks that makes it look very ancestral and ancient, but no, it's actually like well placed within the clade that contains quote unquote modern and derived frogs. And then you, in here you have the fanged frogs, such as Limnonectes. Uh, these guys have big bulldog-like heads, and if you open their mouth, they've got these fang-like projections. So they like bite and hold on, and they're voracious eaters. They like, like really bite down hard and kill stuff with them. Limnonectes ingeri. And in this group you also have Nanofris marmorata, once again a, a, a sideliner. Like, this is how nature operates, basically. For every line there's like a dozen sidelines. But uh, they all have the same pattern going somehow if you look at them close enough. And then you got the... Now these are kind of getting to be like more proper pond frog-like types, these smooth frogs. But if you see everything we've studied so far, they're actually extremely diverse. You got Eflictis hexadactylus, the, the smooth frog, whatever. And then you got these Indian... I think they're Indian bullfrogs. These guys are called Hoplobatracus tigerinus, and the males have this weird yellow color and these blue kind of blue inflatable voice sacs, and they're just a rowdy bunch, and <laughs> they're just beautiful. 
just look at them i mean looks like someone colored this with photoshop but no this is their real color so so there nature is interesting like this sometimes let me take a little sip all right hoplobatracus tigerinus and then in this group you also have the kind of burrowing smooth-faced frogs represented here by the genus Spherotheca breviceps so this is like uh, in the first episode or the second episode we saw rain fro no we saw the spade foot toads this is like a Natat Anuran attempt to evolve a spade foot toad again but once again the leg shape gives it away as a kind of more like froggy frog but the faces and the legs have also have like assumed the proportions that coincidentally look similar anyways moving on you got this genus Fervaria limnocaris once again a regular looking frog but it's got this nice rhombus shaped eyes one of the few shape few uh, few cases where like cornered shapes occur in nature so there in this group you also have the micrizalidae a big family now these guys are very strange they're called i think let me just check my reference sheet they're madagascan stream frogs okay they're very small and they have evolved a unique form of signalization not only do they make these sounds with their throat sacs but they have this umbrella leg display so they're sitting on a tiny stream on a rock and they're just going like whoosh, leg swipe whoosh, leg swipe and it's just very interesting and very intriguing it almost looks like something out of a like zen almost like a japanese garden like scene but of course this is in madagascar and it's very charming that the males somehow like sometimes put their legs around the females to impress them and it's just beautiful and just shows us whether you're frog or human there's nothing new under the sun and then in this group you have the very big family of uh, should we call this how how long has your have we recorded for no maybe let's power through how many slides do we have left oh my god oh man telling i i'm gonna maybe have to make a decision all these guys okay let's power through until we reach running a proper and then we'll cap off this episode and it will have to be another episode but let's move on let's move on okay so we got the big group of Manteli Dae frogs, which have kind of like, they're also Malagasy frogs. They're like these glass-like tree frog-like Madagascan frogs, but they're actually different. By the way, I made a mistake. This this group, Micrizalida, they're not called Madagascan frogs. They're called dancing frogs, as they should be with these legs. Moving on, the Manteli Dae group is represented by Bofis, this brightly colored guy. And there are a lot of Boofis out there. Boofis, Doofis. All colors of eyes fuss. Ah, sorry, my brain is just frying, but just look at them. They're extremely diverse. Unbelievable. With these three colored eyes, dark blue, blue, white, yellow. What's going on? And then in this group, there's like the proper more frog-like looking Lalistominae group represented here by Lalistoma. But then you got the proper Mantellin group, which contains these like brightly colored, almost poison arrow frog like uh, frogs like blow merzia also gephyromantis a really fascinating and beautiful name just look how long these legs and digits are they're just beautiful and once again the spiky flesh fold action is just sublime and then you got guibe mantis with a spectacular galaxy like star color I think these marks really mean a lot to these animals when they look at each other from their own perspective, in, from a leaf or from adjacent angles. Guibe mantis pulcar. And then you got Mantia dactylus, another tree frog like customer. And you got Spinomantis, which is similar to Guibe mantis, but spiky. And this guy takes the skin fold action to a new level. It's just unbelievably beautiful. Spinomantis, Fimbriatus, and I guess these guys are also under threat because many people want to keep them as pets. But let me tell you something, even if you take the best care of these animals, you're still hurting their populations unless you breed them. And not many people can breed them, so just leave it alone. Just look at their pictures. Watch my podcast instead. Another sp Spinomantis species is Spinomantis fantasticus, as it should be. 
a wet, moist, spiky, lichen mimicking customer. But you also have these guys. High fashion, Spinomantis elegance, the elegant lava pattern, electric yellow frog. I just made that name up. But it's really a beautiful match with those long legs and that smooth skin and those beautiful markings. And then you got Singimantis, which is like bluer color than strange. This is a Madagascan name, I think, Singi. And then you got the proper Mantella frogs. Now, these guys are like Madagascar's answers to South American poison arrow frogs. We saw them in a few podcasts earlier. And you got things like Mantella viridis. Almost looks like the golden poison arrow frog, but it's actually different. Completely different, in fact, because it comes from a different branch of the frog family altogether. You got the golden ones. They even have the gold thing going on with Mantella auri aurantiaca. And then... You got these guys, Mantellas, these splotchy yellow orange ones, these guys, just fascinating. And some of them have extremely limited ranges. And then you got, I'm not even gonna, I'm just gonna sing to describe. I mean, it's really humbling. Then you got the Nitri Niktibatrakidae family, they're called. For some reason, the family is known as night frogs, obviously, because they come out at night and they're just drab and beautifully camouflaged. And some of them have these like really funny, wonky looking eyes, such as Lancanectes corrugatus here. Just examine this face and weep. Weep that you may never be this beautiful. And it's also have this like almost like a fingerprint kind of pattern going on with the skin just beautiful just beautiful sees all and knows all anyways moving on you also have the uh, galaxy frog astrobatracus curiciana with the star like spy star like spots and then this this beguiling smile and then you got the odonto batrachidae family for some reason they're called toothed frogs i don't know why but this is Odontobatracus natator, a wide-bodied, warty, tree frog-like customer. Oh, that's why they call them, because they, they're, their teeth have these like lower projecting spikes, and the, the teeth also have got this almost like Spinosaurus-like recurve action going on, but you, know, you would never be able to tell just from seeing the faces alone. Everything un- is obscured under the mouth tissue. And just interesting. Then you got Petro Petropedeitadae. They're called grassland frogs. Another hugely diverse gr- group that we're just gonna glaze over. Here is, and then here is this group, Firnobatrachidae, which they call them puddle frogs. So these guys were not grassland frogs. My mistake. They're called torrent frogs. The, these are grassland frogs. No, these are puddle frogs, and these are grassland frogs. I just skipped over three entire families because they're so wide. There are many, many species and gen- genuses in all these families, and I just don't have the time to describe them all. But if you deep dive into them yourself, you can find out more. Ptica denidae, represented here by Ptica dena oxyrhynchus. Nice uh, eardrum action, as big as the eye. And, and these three circles, they're just aesthetically really beautiful there are of course many 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 species of Pticadenas and they're all beautiful some of them are red some of them are yellow blue black brown every color under the sun and then you got the related genus Hildebrandtia which is this guy Hildebrandtia ornata posing with a fly on its nose once again frog jewelry and then you got the Pixicephalidae family Another big family with subgroupings such as Cacosterninae, represented here by Amietia. These are like more regular-ish. And then there are also some smaller versions in this group as well, such as Anhydrophrin and Arthropleptella. This is almost like a, a frog that said, I, I give up on the frog thing and I want to be a small toad now. So it's almost like a small toad or a booger. And then in this group, you got the extremely diverse genus Cacosternum. And many, many forms and colors. I mean, just look at them and weep while I 
have some water to refresh myself. Mm. And then in this group you got the extremely tiny frogs of the genus Mitrobatrachella. They're really tiny. For just to be interesting, they didn't point, pose it on a coin or on somebody's fingernail this time. But they're tiny and beautiful. And then you got the South African Natalobatracus, which has a kind of like... This is a very rare and phylogenetically, phylogenetically distinct species, so there. And then in this group you also have like the dark toad-like Pointonia, which kind of like lives in a very restricted habitat. But you can see how it came from these ancestors, but it decided to like stub, snub its nose and turn it, its skin kind of pebbly and toady and reduce the size of its limbs. I wonder if there are any game developers out there who are like competent enough and they maybe can do a frog character creation engine with all these different sliders you can adjust for like head pointiness, head flatness, nose pointiness, eye color, skin color, limb length, anything. It could be a really nice, nice game to play. Just generate frogs and and examine them. Yeah, so this was point, point, uh, Pointonia. And then you got the also distinct Strongylopus frogs. There are many species of them out there. And they also feature strongly in South African stamps. This is Strongylopus fasciatus. And then you got the pudgy burrowing Tomopterna frogs. Once again, you realize that forms mean nothing like the lineages are the main thing and the lineages can take the same similar form or the same form over and over and over and over again and then we reach the pixie cephalidae family these are like more bullfrog like frogs basically represented here by obria subsigillata the pale eyes are i think an artifact of photography they don't look like this and then you, of course, you have the Pixicephalus adspersus frogs, which are the giant, voracious African bullfrogs. And many people know these guys. They are pretty common in the pet trade, but they're distinct from Pac-Man frogs. Sometimes people call them giant Pac-Man frogs, but no, they're like evolutionarily distinct. And they have these like vicious fights between the males in the mating season. Then it's just like... Uh, high sigma chad energy lifestyle for these guys fighting over and over again but you also have smaller species such as pixicephalus edulis which means they're edible i guess somehow i don't know and then we reached <laughs> we reached remember this was ranoidea and we've been looking at afro i think what were they called we were looking at the Oh, my brain is completely fried. We were looking at the uh, Afro Batrachia and Natatanura supergroups. Now we reached another supergroup, the Ranidae supergroup. And this will have to be an episode for like a an undertaking for the next episode because my brain is now so fried that I feel humbled by the diversity of these frogs. And while I was talking in the background, my mind was composing this Turkish and Ottoman poem about the humbling diversity of life. Because as we look at these things, you know, it's like really all these forms repeating themselves in distinct patterns, subtly different, you know, all these shapes, lineages. I mean, if you look at the cladistics, it's the story of families and it's the story of life taking on different forms as it evolves. And there's something very personable. Like, you got to realize all these evolutionary adaptations, they're also the results of choices. They are results of pop mutations, okay? But there are also like, there's also willpower involved, willpower involved on behalf of the animals. So there's something like deeply almost religious about it. And I, I, I feel like saying, Nameleri okuyor ceddi yaşam ile yaradan gör sevki dinle ey aciz insan This is one of my many hobbies is uh, I'm a big fan of Ottoman era poetry and early Turkish era poetry 
and they really have a way with language. So I was composing this poem on the side as I was reading out all these weird frogs to you. So this poem is my farewell to you. Once again, I will read it. I hope you like it. And you know, uh, Turkish language is uh, like a really distinct and beautiful language, especially for things like poetry and songs and swearing. I think it's like leagues beyond English. Once again, I read you my humbling divine inspiration on the diversity of frogs. And before saying farewell, let me once more say Nameleri okuyor ceddi yaşam ile yaradan Gör, sev ki dinle, ey aciz insan And a translation would be With the, with the lineage of life, the creator sings you the verses of his or her song See, love, so that you can listen Oh, you futile human being. Anyways, this was episode 6 of the Frog Extravaganza. This was CM Kozaman. Please support me on Patreon.com and see you in the next episode. Goodbye and have a nice day.